Hey guys, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, today we're going to be talking about the multimodal approach to pain management, which I've been doing for quite some time at this point, um, and also doing it on a house call basis, which I really feel like adds a good twist to it and is really better for the client and the patient overall. So let's kind of let's get going. Here's a little about me. I went to the University of Delaware, got a degree in animal science way back in 1995. Um, I went right on from undergraduate veterinary school, went to the University of Pennsylvania, finished in 1999, moved to Washington, D.C. to do an internship at Friendship Hospital for Animals, because my initial plan was to be a veterinary radiologist, didn't get into any radiology residencies, not even my own alma mater, where I did like double rotations in, in large animal radiology and small animal radiology, it just didn't quite work out, so I went into clinical practice, stayed in the D.C. area for a bit. Um, after 9-11, I needed to get out of D.C. because it became a hostile place. So I moved to Seattle where I had a lot of commonality with people at the time. I also was a part-time yoga teacher and there's a great yoga community there. And I, um, I've always had an interest in complementary and alternative medicine for myself as I have intervertebral disc disease and chronic pain, some which I like worsened by doing a lot of yoga. And uh, so I sought acupuncture and chiropractic and I figured I needed to bring uh, that to my patients somehow. So I started when I was in Seattle going to the IBIS basic training, which brought me down to San Diego once a month, which was a lovely getaway from the Seattle area, which is kind of miserable in the winter. Um, and so I did that in 2005, 2006. At that time, I had some kind of life changes, a, a relationship ended, a job opportunity brought me to Los Angeles. And so um, when I got to Los Angeles, of course, I'm like working in a realm where I might walk into a, a, a hospital room and suddenly there's a person that's an entertainment fixture that I've that I've noted for a long time, and it kind of became like an exciting way to go about day-to-day -day practice. And a neighbor of mine at the time was a publicist, and he said, hey, you should start doing some media work back in like 2007. So I started blogging, doing radio, doing some TV work, and eventually got a certified veterinary journalist certificate in 2013. Um, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I go to clients' homes, I take it, I offer an integrative approach. So I'm still doing my Western Medicaid medicines and everything. I'm just applying the Chinese medicine. Uh, kind of, I really kind of think of it as a like complementary and alternative medicine. So I love working in clients' homes. It's a great experience. It's really nice for them. Uh, this is pre-COVID, of course. I'm working on my patient, uh, Mindy there. She's an old poodle with very advanced kidney disease and inflammatory bowel disease. And the little dog on, on the right is my patient buddy who I sometimes care for. I call it vet sitting. He stays with me when his parents travel. And the owner really liked that another poodle was coming to visit her poodle. It provided some companionship because that dog didn't have another dog friend after her sister died of cardiac hemangiosarcoma a couple years before. So it's, it's kind of fun to practice like this. I really enjoy being in the home space with clients. I also work on a part-time basis at Veterinary Cancer Group in Culver City. Um, I do that same holistic approach, but I offer it to cancer patients. I do this I'm not doing this right now in facility because I'm a little concerned about me being exposed to COVID from, say, other people in the practice where I work, and I really have to prioritize my health so I can prioritize the health of my patients and my clients. But I really enjoy that opportunity to work with cancer patients. We're going to have some examples of cancer patients I've worked with a little bit later. Here's a non-cancer patient, though. Here's a little Norbert, one of the most famous dogs on social media, especially on Instagram. Definitely check him out if you don't know him. He's an awesome little guy. He's a true therapy dog, too. He actually goes to hospitals and makes people's lives just better. Um, he's got such a big following. People love to see Norbert. And actually, Norbert has intervertebral disc disease. So um, he loves to get in his OCC loop lounge. He does it twice a day for 15 minutes when he's got more acute inflammation or just once a day is maintenance. And I see him once a month to do um, adequate injections and just a holistic health check at home. So I used to see Norbert in at Veterinary Cancer Group. Now I go to see him on a house call basis. Also, pure dog food, um, incredible opportunity for me to become chief veterinary officer and part owner in the past year. There's five recipes. It's whole food, it's organic, but for the vitamin mineral mix, it's all veterinary nutrition is formulated. Um, we FedEx deliver, there's a driver delivery in the local part of LA, like within five miles of our commercial kitchen. And then it's also sold at some of our retail partners. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of Air One, Air One's like a fancier. Uh, Whole Foods, it's a really great place where people go and be like, oh, I want to impulse buy this, this package of dog food. So it's worked out great. Also, Healthy Spot, which is a really good um, pet store at Vanderpump Dogs. You might know the name Vanderpump from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Lisa Vanderpump has a pet rescue area where we have a refrigerator as well. So this is our Air One uh, Pure Refrigerator. The, in the middle is founder Lindsay Gores and her husband Ali Amadi that runs the show. And they're awesome. I'm really proud to be part of this opportunity to try to share the message of 
healthier feeding options for your dog and soon to be cats. <laughs> We've got some great treats as well. We've got chicken and parsley treats, which cats love. It's just dehydrated, low heat cooked chicken and parsley. We've got a peanut butter and a cheddar's better biscuit. We're gonna have a turkey and beef treat in 2021. And then we have two feline recipes in development, a poultry and a seafood. So also I'd like to spread the message of holistic health out there. Here I'm, I'm talking about CBD, of course, like it's controversial. Should we prescribe, should we recommend? Um, seems like the legality is working out that we actually can, but I still think it's good to do your homework. Um, and here I'm not advocating for a specific product. I'm just talking about the benefits. Also talking about um, periodontal disease care on home and family, which is a Hallmark Channel show. Actually, the guy on the left, Mark Steins, is my client. He's Norbert's dad. And then doing a little uh, media work uh, with Carolyn McAteer, who some of you may know from CC at the Westminster Dog Show, which I haven't gone to in a while. Um, it's just a challenging, it's so challenging to get away right now to like do anything beyond just working in veterinary practice. So why do I take the integrative approach in my practice? I, this, I practice what I preach. This is me getting cupping treatment. I have like, I'm an active person. I'm 47 at this point, got to kind of stay healthy and, and fit to try to be functional so I could best serve my patients. So I just do a lot of this of my own. I get chiropractic every two weeks. I get acupuncture every two weeks. I've got osteoarthritis and IVDD, and I want to minimize my need to take medications like anti-inflammatories, um, GABA analogs, pain numbing drugs like tramadol or something like that, or muscle relaxers. So I do all this myself and I understand how it works with me. So I feel like I can apply it to my patients. I also eat a whole food diet. Um, I do yoga at least once or twice a week. I exercise every day. Um, I just really want to try to go about feeling my best self in my capacity and try to take that to my patients. I do this in part because I have had this very special dog, Cardiff, who you saw in the initial introduction picture. Cardiff was a very special dog in a lot of ways because he had special ailments too. He, <laughs> we're gonna talk about him, he's one of my case studies. But um, I would learn so much as a result of trying to deal with Cardiff's problems and I needed to take that approach beyond just the conventional approach to integrate the Chinese medicine approach. So today we're gonna learn um, what it's like to work as a holistic house call veterinarian in Los Angeles, to learn how it's like to practice, even though we have COVID, to become familiar with some special precautions I have to take with working with pets in their homes during the COVID era, to experience some of the stories of some of my canine and feline house call patients, both pain management and otherwise, to learn about complementary and alternative medicine treatments I use in my practice to help manage my patient's pain, to get a sense of which patients are appropriate candidates for particular treatments, to understand indications and contraindications of certain complementary and alternative treatments, to review case studies where I use complementary alternative medicine to manage my patient's pain and overall health and wellness. So let's launch right now. I have some palate cleanser slides too. I like to like take photos of uh, things I see around town or when I travel that I just find are entertaining. And now as we're all so focused on cleanliness and things being sanitary, I thought this was kind of entertaining because they misspelled the word cleanliness and they wrote cleanness. This is at a nail salon down the street where I sometimes get pedicures because you know, you've got to take care of your, your feet too. Um, so what I offer in, in practice is a very thorough medical, rec rec medical record uh, pre-consultation review. I'm calling specialist general practice, sometimes in LA, sometimes elsewhere. And I'm doing a very thorough evaluation so I can really get a full sense of what's going on with my patients. Of course, I'm doing a physical examination. In going to clients' homes, you can do an environment and lifestyle assessment that you may not be able to do in the hospital. So it's really good to look all around the house, look in the yard, look for like places your patients could get injured, could consume dirt, um, soil, mulch, toxic plants, et cetera, figure out like what the housekeepers are doing that could potentially sicken the pet. So many times where like the housekeepers are feeding too much or giving too many treats or not doing the medications correctly. A lot of my clients have staff, so I have to figure out how to work best with the staff as well. I do lots of dietary modifications and I'm, I'm perfectly fine if the client wants to do a whole food diet that isn't pure dog food or maybe we do a veterinary nutritionist um, con consultation either locally at like Cornell, I use Cornell quite a bit. Um, I directly dispense some products, medications, supplements. Um, sometimes I work with great local compounding pharmacies like Mix Lab or human pharmacies, kind of whatever we can do to get the medication to the client fastest. Um, after I see a patient, and this is like sometimes the bane of my existence, I do this post-consultation email summary, which is like a report card of overall impression, uh, physical exam findings, laboratory assessments, medication supplements, feeding, next plan. And sometimes it takes me an hour to do this. Fortunately, like with repeat visits, I can copy, paste, and modify, but it is like sometimes I spend so much time on my computer and that's why I'm looking forward to like 
five to eight years to semi-retire. Um, I feel like I've done enough being in practice for 21 years at this point. I think somewhere between 25 and 30 is a good time to start doing less. But right now it's a, it's a really good time to be in business because people want you to come to their homes. They don't want to go to the veterinary hospital where they don't get to see their vet. And I, I provide a concierge level of care. So my clients have a problem. They're directly communicating with me. I've set parameters, of course, like after 8 to 10 p.m., I'm ideally not on my phone anymore. I turn my phone off at 1030. Um, they text, they call, they email. I try to do email for consultations that are not emergency, but text and phone, of course, for emergency. I often are coordinating emergency and specialty care, having them go to this hospital, seeing this particular doctor. Now clients are like having problems getting appointments with specialists. So when I, experience, when I hear that they can't get an appointment for a month and a half, I then call or email the specialist and say, hey, this is an important case. Can we make it work? And usually I can get them in a lot more quickly. Um, I also advocate directly for clients and patients in a hospital setting. Sometimes I'm going and spending time with them in the hospital. This is Sophia the cat who had inflammatory bowel disease and kidney disease and actually moved into her client's house for two and a half months in 2015. It's a husband and wife couple that are actors and they're leaving to do projects. And who's gonna take care of the cat and their new golden retriever puppy, but me. <laughs> so my husband, Phil and I moved into the house, gave Sophia fluids and the skin every day. She needed to go to a specialty practice. So I would bring her to the practice and get whatever needed to be done. Sometimes I, it's like certain clients would want me just to be there with the pet, not necessarily doing house sitting. And so I would meet them there. I'd be behind the scenes so that the pet has somebody familiar. Um, it's not an all the time thing because it actually takes time away from me from seeing other patients when really like, they could just have a technician doing this, but really just kind of depends on what the client wants. And then I can communicate with them the whole time. This is what's happening. The findings are good. The findings are not so good. We need to take the next steps, et cetera. Um, it's a unique place to be sometime when you're that patient advocate. I also do lots of laboratory testing. I really think actually my favorite part of veterinary medicine is interpreting labs and kind of following the trends and figuring out the treatments that are going to help to improve and figure out what we need to do next. So lots of blood testing, especially antibody titers. I mean, why immunize our pets for things that they may not necessarily need? Um, and so like I, I, I do Vaxacheck titer a lot, which is this titer. It's an in-home kit that uh, gives you the distemper, adenovirus, parvovirus, antibody results within 30 minutes. So it's really helpful to prevent unnecessary vaccination. And I had to kind of take that approach with my dog, Cardiff. We'll get into that in a little bit. Lots of pee evaluation too. I love looking at urine. I used to like not really understand why urine was so important when I was first in practice, but now I really understand how incredibly important it is, especially doing chronic pain management. You've got patients on non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Are they harming the kidneys? What's going on with the urine concentration? Is there protein? I find it so interesting. And I get so many patients coming from breeders and rescues at this point, like every patient comes to LA having some degree of parasitism. There's been lots of Giardia that's been really challenging to treat as of late, like first I'm starting with metronidazole and fenbendazole, of course with probiotics and other GI supporting agents. And sometimes we have to go up to um, azithromycin and drontail as a cocktail, which actually is really effective. And I love doing PCR testing on, fe on feces as well, looking for more unusual causes like circovirus. Has anybody heard of that? Who knew? This newish virus causes like mild chronic inflammation in the intestines. Um, I also find clostridia really interesting too, because it's in the soil. Sometimes it gets in dogs and just lives there. Doesn't cause a problem. I do in-house cytologies for ear and skin, skin impression smears. Um, swabbing the ears. I love working in my little laboratory down in my garage. Um, any, F, any FNAs, I feel like I just don't have the experience level to give the best assessment. So I send those off to the lab. I want that official pathology result. Um, I don't do x-rays on a house call basis for clients, but I coordinate to have them done by working with local specialty hospitals. This is actually a patient of mine that was having like chronic weird behavior, chronic digestive issues, not wanting to eat as well, just seeming off. And it turns out that she has eight lumbar vertebra and that was causing back pain. And now we fix that and she's doing much better. Um, of course I do in-home euthanasia. Uh, it's something that I really feel is a great thing to offer clients because it's more personal. They can be there with their family members, friends, sometimes even have a little party to have everybody say goodbye. Um, certainly with COVID now, when clients can't go into the hospital, it makes euthanasia so much more challenging. I mean, who wants to say goodbye to their beloved pet on a FaceTime call? Not me, certainly. Um, I sometimes transport the pet as well, depends on what needs to be done. If a crematory can't meet me at the house, then I'm taking the pet to my West Hollywood location. They're going to freezer. Jane Lynch, long-term client and friend, 
two of her dogs that I've euthanized over the years has been actually four. Um, that's Gentle Ben and Olivia. Olivia was named after Olivia Newton-John. Um, it's really just kind of fun, cool working with people like Jane. She's a really great pet lover. She and her partner rescue tons and tons of pets that otherwise are like senior dogs and wouldn't have a chance. So love Jane. Um, do travel health certificates. I swear, like I lose sleep over these things. Like the, the, the T isn't crossed right. The I isn't dotted right. And it's all, all goes to pot. Um, I've gotten better doing them over time. And the whole process is now easy as you can, you can actually fill everything out online through the APHIS site. So that makes it a lot more easy than handwriting everything. So I'm just microchip skinning a cat here. I do domestic and international health certificates because patients travel all over the place at this point. Um, my clients like to take their pets places and sometimes like, are you really sure you want to take your pet? It probably should be better that they just stay here in LA where it's nice and safe. I also do vet sitting. Um, I mentioned that before. Here's Sophia the cat and Phil. This is actually at our home in West Hollywood. She hung out with us for two weeks. Hung out, I mean like boarded with us before she moved to New York and then she's ultimately passed away since then. Here are two little dogs, three little dogs, Biggie on the top, Vader in the middle and Rue down the bottom. Uh, Vader's the teacup Pekingese, a super cute dog, but I never recommend anybody getting a dog like this because not only are they very expensive, but they have lots of expensive medical problems, being a three and a half pound Pekingese from Korea. Uh, Biggie and Rue, the Maltese and Poodle are a little bit easier. There's a, um, a singer, a client of mine, a very well-known singer that are, no, um, those are her two dogs. I'm not going to name who she is because got to protect her privacy. So with Sophia having chronic illnesses, kidney disease, inflammatory bowel disease, every day I'm giving fluids under her skin. She loved Honest Kitchen goat milk, which is a probiotic digestive enzyme blend. It really kind of perked her up and I was able to mix other things in there too, like amino B-plex from RX vitamins, RX clay to kind of soothe her gut. Um, lots of good things. Palate cleanser slide here, social distancing, Vader's like Fran, the black pug, get away from me. We're supposed to be social distancing. I just thought this was such a cute little photo and a good representation that we still need to consider social distancing as I do every day. <laughs> All right, so pre-COVID, I got to work with clients in their homes. It was so much fun. Didn't have to like wear masks or anything like that. Here's Demi Moore, long-term client of mine. I, I never asked for a photo uh, with clients unless I get to know them really well. There's some like important reason. She had a book out last year. I bought like 60 copies of her book, got him, her to sign them to give to family and friends. And I figured this is like the one time I feel okay asking to take a photo because I just think it's tacky otherwise. I think like they're, they're just people, like celebrities are people, let them be, treat their pets, you're not their fan, you're just their vet. Um, so she's been great, I love working with her daughters too. Pre-COVID, I didn't have to wear face masks, didn't have to wear rubber gloves all the time. Of course, I wear rubber gloves, you know, when doing certain things, but that was such a comfortable place to be with a little peanut on my lap. Now, post COVID, even like pets have to social distance. Sometimes people are afraid to take their dogs for a walk in their neighborhood because they're going to encounter people. It's so it's such a challenge, I think, to for people to deal with that. But I feel like you have to get out. You have to be responsible. Wear your face mask. Cross the street if needed, but get your dog out. Exercise them. Now with COVID, of course, I have to wear face masks all the time. Um, I don't have to, but I choose to. Even though I, have, I go to clients' homes and they say, oh, you don't need to wear a mask. And I say, I'm just going to do it to protect you in case I was exposed and I'm asymptomatic. So now Phil and I wear PPE all the time. Two little dogs that I'm holding, um, Rocky and Snickers or Poodle Shans that we sometimes care for. And then there's Vader with, Finn hold, uh, with Phil holding him. He's all gray faced now because he's surprisingly reached six years old. I didn't think he was going to make it. I even wear my PPE when I go to the grocery store, like plastic um, gloves, I think are a good tool because even though it doesn't really live on surfaces for that long, you just kind of never know or somebody could have just sneezed and then you get it on your hands and then you touch your face or your eyes or something like that. So post COVID, I see patients out in lawns. Um, this was actually a beautiful place to go. This was Los Olivos, which is about two hours north of LA. I normally wouldn't drive this far, but this little Yorkshire Terrier that you see here was probably the most special patient I've ever had. That was Lukey. He was one of the patients I'd have to do in hospital advocacy for. So when the family decided that they wanted to get away from LA, they moved to a horse ranch um, about 30 minutes north of Santa Barbara. And Lukey had chronic uh, kidney disease, malignant liver cancer, and heart disease. And so he, he was like taped together. He looked great, but he was, on the inside, it's not so good. So I would go up there two to three times a week and a technician would go up there every day to do assessments and treatments on Lukey. But it was beautiful to get out and to be on this lovely lawn. I love to be in a wide open space. 
Um, and also the, they had a great hiking trail on their property. So Phil and I would do a three mile walk after we saw Loki and I got to see all sorts of cool things like a, uh, a gopher snake, not a rattler, kind of looks like a rattler except for the slim head and obviously no rattle at the end. But I'm always a little fearful when I see a snake on a hiking trail in Los Angeles and this thing can bite you, but of course you're not gonna be poisoned by it like a rattlesnake. Um, here we are seeing Norbert. I, I, when I, I see Norbert outside of the home now. They have a beautiful front porch area in this area of Los Angeles called, um, pa, oh, let's see, pa, I, I'm gonna move on, I can't remember, but it's like perched up on a hill. You can actually see the ocean, get ocean breezes, it's lovely. So I'm outside on a front porch where it's fresh air. This is right at the start of COVID where I felt like I need to wear glasses or goggles to protect my eyes. Now I'm just a little more lax, but definitely still the face mask and gloves most of the time. I see patients on uh, driveways. Here's a little Finn who we saw looking out the window before. Um, that's not my car, uh, it's a client's fancy car. <laughs> I have a more basic car than that. But it's great just to kind of be out and about and outside, except for when sometimes the neighbor walks by and wants to like lob their vet question at you. Um, and then post COVID, I see patients in backyards as well. There's like cats. Um, my concern is cat seeing a cat patient outside because Cats are sometimes harder to handle. This is a kitten. There were actually eight of them in this backyard that I was helping for a bit until they all ended up disappearing. The mom took them elsewhere. We're trying to get a spay or neuter group to go help to capture them, but we're not able to do so. But when you're seeing cats outside, there's that additional concern of what's going to happen if they get away from you. That's kind of why I prefer to see the kitties inside. Post COVID, I work in clients' garages as well. Um, Fox actually contacted me about talking about COVID back in March. So they contacted me as I was on the way to this appointment. And so they came and filmed me in the client's garage. And I talked about initially, like people were saying uh, pets shouldn't have a concern for uh, getting COVID and dogs less so because I, they don't really have receptors that match as well as cats and people as far as I'm aware, but then dogs have gotten sick. And I just feel like you never know what's going to happen with disease, these diseases that jump species. So of course there is potential a dog could be sick and a cat could be sick and a ferret, a mink now that we know is they're getting sick in, in, in Europe. Post COVID, I still see patients in clients' homes. I'm just very well masked up. Here's a young bulldog, a really interesting moral color. And then post COVID, sometimes my patients come to see me in my garage in West Hollywood. Here's Maggie and Rossi, two little special, special patients of mine. They are super well-trained performing dogs. They're dog models. They work in movies. Their mom, Nicole Ellis, is an amazing dog trainer. My garage is really well ventilated and I socially distance from the client there, of course. Um, sometimes patients move out of town, like Lukey moving up to Los Olivos to me and her daughter, Rumor, and two other daughters move to Idaho where they have a second home. So when they have health problems, I would video conference with them. That works out pretty well. And I'm just really grateful, even like we're, I, I guess we're not post COVID yet, we're, we're in COVID, that um, I'm still able to work like I did before. I just am masked up and working outside. I, I really feel for the veterinarians that have to work in a hospital facility now, not have that face to face contact, which I guess sometimes it's good if you have that client that's challenging, but I really like to get to know my clients well. And it's a long term process, it's a personal process. I trust them, they trust me, and that's the way that I'm gonna to continue to practice until I semi-retire at eight years. Palette cleanser slide. Of course, like maybe right now everybody's wearing face masks. It's not the best time to develop that new romantic relationship. But I actually wonder, like especially in Southern California as we're, it's always sunny, if face masks are gonna to help to make people's faces healthier because you're gonna be blocking the sun a little bit, just could be a benefit there. Moving on to kind of the, the, the bit of our, our presentation here, talking about complementary alternative medicine. Let's start with TCVM or traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. Uh, veterinary medicine, of course, is an offshoot of traditional Chinese medicine or TCM. It is over, even the veterinary aspect is over 3,500 years old. And that's all, of course, way longer than veterinary medicine has been around. Um, so we have to like take I, I, not all aspects of TCVM, I feel like are applicable to the patients I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I take certain pieces of it, but I feel like the concepts make sense to me and we can bring them and integrate them into conventional veterinary practice. All right, um, Chinese medicine, the basis is yin and yang. All beings are formed of this intricate balance of energy. If we're looking at that symbol on the right, our traditional Chinese medicine symbol, the black is the yang, Y-A-N-G, and the white is the yin. And you can see they're kind of melding into each other. And there's a little bit of yin and the yang, a little bit of yang and the yin. And you always want to maintain that perfect balance. 
If we don't maintain that balance, then diseases and other problems start to occur. So the yin is considered internal, cooling, moisturizing, settling, and feminine. And you see it's kind of like moving down. That's the settling aspect of it. And uh, yang is external, warming, drying, uplifting, and masculine. So like warm things move up, cool things move down. That's how Chinese medicine works. Um, on the pain management modalities that I offer for clients are acupuncture, of course, that includes needle, laser acupuncture, which could be applying a laser to an acupuncture point or just kind of running it down the body, down it, running it over meridians. Electrostimulation, we're going to see more of this a little bit later. Moxibustion, aquapuncture, aquapuncture, acupressure, and of course, targeted pulse field electromagnetic th field therapy. Um, which technically isn't acupuncture, but it can have an acupuncture-like effect. I'm working on my patient, Ella, here um, in her client's guest bedroom. Ella's getting needle and laser acupuncture treatment here to help to um, deal with side effects from intravertebral disc disease. This is a low-power laser they use. I'll get into that. That's why I'm not wearing goggles, nor is the patient. And of course, physical rehabilitation. Um, acupuncture is the insertion of needles along the body's energy channels. There are 12 plus two. And by placing those needles in these spots, we are creating an energetic change by promoting blood flow to the site, by modulating the nervous system response and their motor response, and also to help release anti-inflammatory and pain relieving hormones. This is um, my dog Cardiff getting acupuncture treatment to help with issues along his back that he developed just by being an active dog. This is of course pre his health problems. Um, acupuncture points actually have been proven to exist. They're located where lymphatics, blood vessels, and nerves all come together. And I follow anatomic landmarks. Um, some people feel as though they can feel acupuncture points. I don't think I ever developed that skill. And there are acupoint, there are acupoint finders you can use that can somehow detect like electrical changes to the site. But I feel like I know where the points are versus the, based off of the anatomic landmark. And there's actually a Chinese medicine measurement called a sun, a C-U-N, which is a certain distance. It's almost like a centimeter, basically. So you can say a point is, say, too soon from the dorsal spinous process of L2. Um, and that's where kidney uh, bladder 23 is, the association point for the kidney, a very commonly used point. So the acupuncture meridians, here's a great chart. Thanks to Herb Smith for letting me use this one. There's the lung, large intestine, stomach, spleen, heart, small intestine, bladder, kidney, pericardium, triple heater, gallbladder, liver, and governing, governing vessel and conception vessel. Um, so the 12 traditionals are the lung through the liver there. And then the two additionals are the governing vessel and the conception vessel. And we'll get into some of these in a little bit. I'm gonna give you some common points and what I use them for. But you see a lot of these points have a correlation with an organ system. Um, it doesn't mean it runs directly through the organ system, but it has correlations with how that organ system functions. And by having these 12 meridians, you're actually creating an energy channel that goes all over the different aspects of the body, the dorsal, the ventral, the palmar, the plantar. Um, and that creates a loop of energy that cycles every 24 hours. We really want to keep that cycle clear so that energy moves well and the body functions best. Um, some common points I use in pain management are points along the governing vessel. So going along the midline of the body, governing vessel 14, 4, and 3. Um, 14 is located at the C721 junction, uh, GV4 is located at the uh, T13 L1 junction, and GV3 is at the L7, unless you have an extra lumbar vertebra, <laughs> S1 junction, and that helps to clear heat. Think like heat rises, it gets stuck there right at the surface, so by needing that spot you can release the heat. Also, um, it goes really like all, as the spine goes from the head to the tail, so you can help to get energy moving from the head to the tail. And this is, these are relatively easy places to have access to with your pets. There's, it's not like you're sticking it on the underside of the foot. You have access to right there, right along the midline of the spine. And they're well-tolerated points too. You can get the needle in there, generally a fairly longer needle, um, and they tend to stay in place, which is a good thing. Moving on bladder, the bladder channel is like a train track running on the right and left side of the vertebral column. The bladder point is also known as the influential point for the bone um, at the C7-T1 junction. Um, yes, that's correct, <laughs> right at the front of the chest, just on the right and left side, just in front of the shoulder blades. Um, and that's a common place if you want to help really anything related to bone. It also kind of starts that energy channel going down the back. Uh, just behind it is bladder 15 at the T4-5 junction. And you can kind of see it's directly above the heart. So it's considered the shoe or association point for the heart. So if you needle that point, you could help to get energy moving better through the heart because energy is going to be moving better down the spine at that point. 
uh, bladder 17 plus one and the association point or the influential point for chi or ki. Chi is our, our energy. We want to always have the best energy possible. That's at the T7, 8 junction on the right and left sides, just behind it, bladder 19, the association point for the gallbladder, which if you drop down, that's where the gallbladder would live. And the gallbladder also has other important correlations like being the, the channel that governs your ligaments and tendons. So if you have a ligament tendon injury, you may want to a needle somewhere along the gallbladder meridian or the bladder 19 point, which affects the gallbladder meridian. Bladder 23, the association point for the kidney is probably the most common point I use. I, um, I mentioned this before, that black dog that was having needles. So at the L2, L3 junction, just on the right and left side, a certain soon, a certain number, a uh, certain space away from the vertebral column, very easy to get a needle in there and also just located directly above the kidneys. If we drop down, you can see the kidneys would live there. You can kind of basically barely see them on this x-ray. And then bladder 28 on the right and left side at that L7 S1 junction. So you have this chain, this bladder chain. This is really easy in a needle. It has a lot of effectivity. I get these points needle myself when I get my treatments and I know it helps my LS discomfort. Um, gallbladder 34, really good point to help anything related to ligament tendon injury or the sinews just on the lateral aspect of the fibula below the, or the tibia below the fibular head, a really easy point to get a needle in, but you're very close to bone. So there can be sensitivity from the periosteum. I would recommend using a shorter needle in this spot. And governing vessel 20, um, a calming sedative point. A lot of times when you have pain, you are kind of more amped up. You don't sleep as well, you don't rest as well. So governing vessel can have that calming effect. I do this almost on all patients when I'm doing treatment because I don't want my patient getting up and moving around and like needles going everywhere. I want them to be calm and cooperative for their treatment. Governing vessel 22, right at the manubrium, tip of the front of the sternum, um, the influential point for phlegm. So phlegm in Chinese medicine is a thick viscous substance, just like that, which clogs up our nostrils sometimes. And phlegm contributes to um, spondylosis deformans, osteoarthritis, sometimes even tumors. So if you needle this point, you're kind of opening up the chest as well if by putting a needle in there and you're helping to clear phlegm. Bladder 40 is the master point for the hind limb. It's in the popliteal fossa, just in the pit of the knee. Not the most comfortable point when I get it done, but I feel like my patients tolerate it pretty well. You wanna use a longer needle in here. It's almost like you're gonna be putting that needle right into where the lymph node is. Um, if you've ever done lymph node aspirate of that spot before, a very common point that I use, but probably not as common as bladder 60, kidney three, right at the junction of the tibia and the tarsus. You can actually needle directly through that web of tissue there. Um, it's also known as the aspirin point. By needling one side, bladder 60, you're going to hit kidney three, and you can do it the other side. Kind of depends on where your patient is. You have to really kind of go with where your patient is willing to cooperate. Are they laying there right side down and you can needle from the at lateral aspect or do you have to come through the medial aspect or maybe do the medial aspect on the left hind limb because that's what you have access to. Um, front limbs, um, this is a really helpful point. The master point for the face and mouth that for us, it's right in the webbing of the fingers, uh, the thumb and the index finger. Uh, it promotes your weight chi, which is your energy that helps to protect you from invading pathogens. If you have any kind of headache, toothache, nasal issue, same thing with your patients, you can needle this place. I find myself sometimes squeezing this when I'm anxious or when I just feel like I need to um, create a little bit of energetic change in my body. Large intestine 11 at the lateral aspect of the elbow. When you fold your elbow crease, it's right there. Good point for the elbow, good point for itching. Um, wind is considered to contribute to itching as you think like wind kicks up allergens, molds, stuff gets in your eyes, respiratory tracts. So we want to try to clear our wind by needling that point. Um, stomach 36 is our master point for our gastro gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal tract. Of course, pain affects the GI tract too. That's at the um, proximal lateral aspect of the tibia, kind of very close to where we saw gall gallbladder 34 before, but more on the front side, kind of just below where the patella ligament attaches. Stomach 40, another master point for phlegm, or in, the other one was, I think, the influential point phlegm. This is the master point for the phlegm. Um, so phlegm also contributing to vestibular disease and seizures. We're going to try to not have that sticky substance mucking up how energy works in the body. So that's a great point to needle to potentially help with the patient. If say you're doing like the multimodal approach to a patient who has seizures and the owner wants you to try to help so the patient needs less medication like phenobarbital or potassium bromide. Um, so spleen six, this is a great uh, point for when you have any kind of pelvic, limb, abdominal organ issue. 
on the medial aspect of the medial malleolus. It's just above where we we're talking about um, kidney, let's see, bladder 60, kidney three before. They're very, very close to each other, but slightly distance apart. Spleen 21 on the lateral aspect of the left intercostal space six, that is an immune system point. It's also considered this connecting point among other points. You just want to make sure when you needle that point, you don't use a long needle and go directly in between the ribs for, to where you would puncture the pleura and create a pneumothorax. You want to use a shorter needle there. Sometimes it's an uncomfortable plot point. I get that needle in myself and I don't really love to have a needle in between my ribs and the muscle there. Uh, we are moving now to the hind limb. We are in uh, liver three. We're going to promote chi. Um, we're thinking about like getting energy moving up the limb from the foot or say the, even if the foot isn't as responsive neurologically, you want to needle that point because it can create a little bit of stimulation there. So I use this point a lot with patients that are kind of old and sick or they have cancer. This is a great kind of triangle of points. They're really commonly used. Uh, bladder 54, the master point for the hind limb. It is just above the greater trochanter. And you have this triangle that you create with gallbladder 20 and gallbladder 30, where you circle the hip. So by hitting these three points on two different meridians, you can help to bring energy, blood flow, et cetera, muscle relaxation to the hip. And of course, so many patients have hip dysplasia and osteoarthritis there that it's a great and very common point to use. You can do this, say, on one side, if the patient is laying down on the other side, you don't want to like place the needles and have the patient pushing into the needles. That's uncomfortable for them. I know I've experienced that myself. Um, some concerns I have for performing acupuncture on patients is you don't want to promote energy flow to sites of cancer, uh, because if you're promoting energy to go there, blood flow, you could promote cells to grow. Of course, like if you're promoting blood flow there, you could also bring white blood cells to try to fight the cancer. So it's a little bit of a, a complicated issue. Should you or shouldn't you? It's an individual thing that you'll figure out on your own. You want to make sure you don't overly sedate a patient when they're already weak or deficient by placing too many needles or do, doing too many sedating or calming points, possibly causing micro trauma and activating a blood clotting cascade with a patient that already may be coagulopathic, like my dog Cardiff, who we'll talk about at the end. Um, here's Sophia the cat. Uh, you wanna make sure you're always doing an appropriate needle size when you're needling your patients. So cats really, I, I love these hand needles. They are so small, they're meant to go in human hands. The actual needle itself is less than a centimeter long. Um, you can apply heat to them. You can apply electricity to them in theory. I don't think it's long enough to keep it in, but like this um, needling Sophia's governing vessel 20 on the top of her head, we don't want to use this long needle that's going to wave around because sometimes when the ears and everything move up there, you'll see the needle move and you want to have a, a nice small needle so it stays in place. Um, I love Watto needles. I tend to use this as my only other needle besides the hand needles. Uh, I use a 13 or a 25 millimeter 0.2 gauge. It doesn't have silicone. Silicone helps to actually make the needle insert smoother and in theory be more comfortable, but then you can't run electric current through it. Um, and also if you run heat through it, it may not be as effective that way. So I love these. They're also individually, they're in individual guide tubes. So that, oh, let me go back to that. Sorry about that. Um, the individual guide tubes are really helpful to not lose them. And they have this copper coil, which helps to conduct electricity through them. Um, you want to be careful not to lose needles. <laughs> um, this is a patient of mine who's a big fuzzy, oh geez, somebody help me with the breed. I'm just completely uh, eluding. Uh, oh well, I <laughs> blanking on it, sorry. Got a chow? Chow chow, thank you. Rescued there. So. Um, those that very long hair hides those needles. And in this case, the copper needles look a lot like his own hair. So um, you can see in the phone on the right, he's got large intestine four in his right front limb. You may be able to barely make out governing vessel 20 at the top of his head. And then on his back, he's got um, so two, bladder 15, I think, which is just above his heart, bladder 23, bladder 54, just above his hip, um, liver three and his left hind limb. So I don't want to lose those needles. Um, you want to make sure that you count them all and keep track of them. It's super important. Laser acup acupuncture actually has been great. So laser, you're applying a cold laser, a low power, not a surgical or higher powered laser in order to create an energetic change directly at an acupuncture point, like where you would place a needle or possibly just run it down a meridian and have an effect. Some patients don't tolerate needles. Well, this patient was a patient that had um, uh, a, a spinal cancer 
and was so reactive to any kind of stimulation, but he tolerated very well when I would do needle treatment on his body instead of placing laser. And actually I would do hot and cold packs down his spine because I couldn't needle along his spine. Also, you want to be careful like driving needle energy to the cancer there. Um, so I find that actually for many of my patients, the laser can provide an even more profound or long lasting effect as compared to needles. So it actually has replaced needles in certain patients of mine. You don't have the concern for needle loss, which is always beneficial, especially in the client's homes. You don't want to leave needles that they're going to step into that another pet may end up stepping on. Laser acupuncture um, helps to reduce tissue swelling, promotes blood flow and energetic movement, just like our needles. Uh, we want to, you of course, use it with caution with cancer patients. We, want to do it, we don't want to do it directly on cancer, directly above or directly below. We don't want to promote that energy directly into the cancer. I use this a bit with Cardiff, um, which we'll get into a little bit after he had a chemotherapy side effect. This actually is a patient of mine, Willie, who had transitional cell carcinoma, so deep in his bladder, this really nasty cancer that caused him to strain and strain and strain, which really fatigued his lumbar uh, lumbar sacral, um, gluteal muscles. And so I would do needle and laser treatment just to help some of that spasming there. But it was all more of a superficial treatment, not getting down to where the cancer was. Moxibustion is really helpful too. I've had this done and I really like the sensation. It's sometimes a little more challenging in patients. Um, you are taking a moxa stick or potentially resin and you're applying it to a needle or near a needle and the heat from the lit moxa stick drives heat down into the body. So it's great like where I am right now at Governing vessel four, bladder 23 on the right and left side. And there's one other point a little further down the side that, that actually helps with the kidneys. Um, and it really helps to promote heat getting into those places where we have arthritic joints, abnormal discs. You just wanna be cautious with long haired patients. You don't wanna burn your patients, of course. And um, you can burn yourself as I did many times. And traditional moxa smells like marijuana, which isn't so bad in people's homes, but in a, in a cl in clinic setting, sometimes that can be a little bit alarming. Um, and just smokeless moxa smells like strong incense. It still has an aroma. It kind of bothers my eyes and my nose. So I really don't use moxa anymore than I have now that I have laser and other techniques. I love electrostimulation. It's really incredibly helpful for dogs that have intervertebral disc disease, any kind of muscle spasming, have had surgery on their back. Um, just a, such a good technique. It also helps to um, stimulate nerves that maybe are not functioning as well. You're promoting energy across wounds or tissues. I had a French bulldog that had a thermal burn on its back and I did electrostimulation a couple times a week for months and that patient healed incredibly quickly. I was so impressed. Um, we have to use it with caution with cancer patients. Of course, you don't wanna run electric current through tumors or along the meridians where the tumors are located because they're gonna be pushing that energy towards the tumor. You wanna do it unilaterally. In this patient, we're doing a red to black and a green to black and a blue to black and a yellow to black. So running electric current on one side of the body along the bladder meridian. Um, the patient has to be still and cooperative, of course, because they get up, they, they move and everything just falls apart. You have to start over. It's kind of frustrating when you do that. So really just for cooperative patients, I don't recommend holding a patient down either to do it. It's kind of counterintuitive. You want them to relax and cooperate for treatment. So they must be quite still. I love aquapuncture as well, the injection of liquids into acupuncture points, vitamin B12, homeopathics like zeal, adequan, um, stimulates that acupuncture point for longer than just a simple needle treatment. Um, adequan is really probably my, one of my go-to medications for almost all patients that have osteoarthritis or could develop it. Um, it's great for cancer patients as well because cancer patients might be taking chemotherapy um, orally or injectably and that could affect their appetite. They may not eat, want to eat as well. And so you don't want your patient to suffer with their comfort and mobility because they're not getting their oral joint supplement. So Adequan is great for them. We just want to be cautious with patients that have renal or hepatic diseases or they're coagulopathic or thrombocytopenic. Acupressure is great too because you can teach owners how to do it. You can do it just as part of your physical exam. You're just pushing your fingertips into a point or your elbow or whatever else you want to push in there. Um, you can teach your owners how to do it as well. They can do it on a daily basis. Also um, targeted pulse electromagnetic field therapy. I love it. It's so helpful. I've noticed such a change in my patients, even like the patients that don't have problems want to want to use it. It's amazing. It's non-invasive. It's non-pharmaceutical. Uh, reduces pain and inflammation. It can accelerate healing. The ACC loop was kind of the, the starting off point. You just lay it right across the patient's hip. You can put the, it over their neck, provided they don't like get all freaked out with it. Um, what I love even more is the ACC loop lounge, the partnership with Sleepy Paw. They have two different models, the Air and the Atom. This is the Atom, I think. It is, uh, both of them are airline approved. So you can have your dog's or cat's treatment on the go. 
there's a, a loop kind of platform that goes in the bottom and the patient just crawls right in and experiences it. And I am so surprised at how patients love this. I have patients in the household that even if they don't need it, the other dog in the house will get will like detect it and get in and just love it. Um, a client of mine is Chloe Grace Moritz, kind of a young up and coming actress. She did a lovely post for us. Um, thank you, Chloe. We really appreciate you sharing on your stories how the CC loop has helped your dog Ruby recover from intervertebral disease surgery. Um, moving along, we've got Chinese medicine food energy. So this is something that we can kind of teach owners how to do as well to best apply at home. We've got cooling, neutral, and warming energies, and that applies to the food and substances that go into the body. So cooling, as mentioned before, is yin. Neutral is kind of right in between, and warming is yang. And it's not an exact science, but I feel like there's some parts of it to me that make sense. And if we can just do a little something on a day-to-day -day basis, because we're feeding our pets anyway, we're giving them treats, you might as well follow a principle that could, in theory, help them to be healthier. And it applies to proteins, vegetables, fruits, grains, beans, and spices. So cooling, we're trying to cool heat associated with certain conditions, think of like inflammation from allergies, cancer, immune mediated diseases, all these conditions where like the, there's, the immune system is turned on and it's trying to manage what's going on. That's where cooling really can come in and, and help. So we've got proteins here that are cooling. Um, these slides can be available afterwards. We've got vegetables, we've got grains. In warming, we're trying to add some of that warming energy to heat up, heat up a slower moving geriatric patients and obese patient. Think like kidney disease, hypothyroidism, osteoarthritis, provided it's not like an acute osteoarthritis flare or maybe something that's immune mediated. We're gonna try to get that warming energy into the body to get up and moving. Our proteins, our vegetables, our grains, Cooling is right in the middle. You can use it for a patient that has cancer or a patient that is old and just needs to be up and moving. And neither warms nor cools, it tends to harmonize. And we've got proteins, we've got vegetables, and we've got grains. Corn, I don't think is like, everybody's so afraid of corn. Feed them like healthy, fresh corn, like you would have corn on the cob yourself. And it's not the only thing that they're eating. It's just part of their diet. They do get some nutrients from it. Um, Chinese, food, Chinese medicine food energy also applies to uh, the format of the food. So dry food is inherently warm or young because you've high heat cooked it, you've sucked all the moisture out of it. Fresh moist food is inherently yin or cooling, like our pure dog food or honest kitchen once it's hydrated. And if you take a dry food like a kibble and you add moisture to it, it's still considered young because of the way that it's prepared, that high heat cooking process and also could potentially promote growth of um, bacteria, which we don't want to go into our patients. I used to cook uh, food for Cardiff. This was his vegetable puree that I would do, a, a bunch of cooling vegetables that I would cook and then puree and then add to cooked meats. Um, so uh, other Chinese medicine food energy therapies are faster growing foods tend to be cooler than plants that take longer to grow. So like above ground, your cucumber, et cetera, um, are going to have more moisture in them. The root vegetables, your potatoes, carrots, even though they're fairly moist, are uh, can be a little bit warming. Um, foods that have higher water content tend to be cooling. Longer and slower cooking methods like roasting or stewing produce, produce more of a warming effect than a quicker cooking method. Uh, moving on to nutraceuticals, commonly used in practice of mine. Um, nutraceuticals are food derived substances having medicinal benefits. This is an actual photo of cat's claw that I took when I did a two week volunteer with Amazon Cares going into the Amazon to provide veterinary care to communities that had nothing. We went to a medicinal garden. I saw where cat's claw very potent antioxidant come from. Under nutraceuticals are included supplements like vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. Herbs are also included in this category. <coughs> Um, nutraceuticals, technically, I guess vitamin B12 is an injection, so it's a medication, but it falls within that nutraceutical category. We've got oral um, B complex as well, which I love, the RX vitamins, amino uh, B plex. B12 is great because it's a water-soluble vitamin. What you don't need, you just pee out, and it really helps so many things, digestion, energy, immune system. Um, I use it for patients that have inflammatory bowel disease. Maybe they're not absorbing their nutrients, their, v, their B12 as well from their gut. So that's where giving an injection is really been very, very beneficial to them. Uh, generally promotes that improved energetic state. 
Um, I give it as an aquapuncture injection, really almost to any patient. I dilute it with sterile water. And generally, it's about half an ml that's given per acupuncture point. So you can hit points directly down the back. Um, I give it actually even if I don't know the patient's B12 level because it is water soluble and what we don't need, we just eliminate. But I find I am testing a lot of patients' B12 levels as well. And then we get an interval of giving them injections and hopefully normalizing their levels. Every seven days for four injections is my usual, and then every 14 or so day ongoing, depending on the patient's needs. Um, the oral is really great to get into them. I really like this, the, this amino B-plex. It's iron, it's B-complex vitamins, it's amino acids that can help with patients that have cachexia. Um, so I really find it beneficial for patients with um, inflammatory bowel disease, kidney disease, cancer, especially if they're getting chemotherapy. It could be affecting their red blood cells. We want to give that, uh, them that iron so they can make hemoglobin. Um, I love pre and probiotics. Here's a cytology. Actually, this is a, an ear cytology, not a gut cytology. Uh, pre and probiotics are so important. Our prebiotics give that, that the food that good bacteria can grow on. And our probiotics are our good bacteria, our non-pathogenic bacteria, not like the salmonella, E. coli, clostridia, et cetera. And they may help to maintain gut flora balance. And if you have a patient that has a better functioning gut, they're going to tolerate their medications better, their chemotherapy, their non sterile anti-inflammatories, Beneficial bacteria can also competitively inhibit bad bacteria so that they don't get in there and overgrow and hopefully stools will stay normal. They can help to promote nutrient absorption and they can also help to promote digestive tract, tract function, especially like if your patient is prone to digestive tract upset from taking a non sterile anti-inflammatory, probiotics can be very beneficial just to help to maintain that gut health. Um, I, there's many different types out there. I really like two of these products from RX Vitamins, Nutrigest and Biotic. Nutrigest is not only beneficial bacteria, but ginger, glutamine, cat's claw, aloe leaf extract, psyllium seed, um, inulin, I think, as a, as a prebiotic. And then RX Biotic is just straight, pro, pro, straight probiotic. Um, I tend to have patients stay on it long term. If they're doing great, eventually get them off. But generally, every 12, 24 hours, every 12 hours, if they're actually having digestive tract upset, um, and the anti-inflammatory aspects of Nutrigest I really like because it has all these just great ingredients that help to promote digestive tract health. Um, I also love it, as I mentioned before, Honest Kitchen Coats Milk. It's a dehydrated product. It's tasty. I've tasted it myself. It's kind of sweet. It's got probiotics, digestive enzymes. You can make your own little puppy or kitty latte. They can drink it. You can syringe feed it. You can eat it right in their food. I also love omega fatty acids. There's my father, Dave Mahaney. This is like uh, 10 years ago. I think he's a little older looking now, but that's what I'm going to look like when I'm in my mid 60s, most likely. Um, and he is he's fishing for salmon in Alaska. And that's why that's relevant to this topic, because fish oil is great, uh, especially fish oil having lots of omega three and nine, which are anti inflammatory omega six, which we tend to think to come from like other meats like other animal fats like beef fat or pork fat that can be pro inflammatory. We still need some of it, but we just don't want to supplement for it. Um, the omega threes and nines have anti inflammatory effects for the joints for the endocrine system for the nervous system. It can help to slow body wasting which inevitably occurs with age or with certain diseases, especially like lack of mobility your patients just kind of waste away. Um, many different options out there I really prefer the standard process and um, and the Nordic Naturals products Nordic Naturals especially. Very low flavor, very low odor, either capsule, which is stable at room temperature or liquid, which has to be refrigerated. The liquid two ounce has that great dosing um, syringe, which makes it so easy. It's super pure. Um, I, I actually take the tuna omega oil myself every day to help with my osteoarthritis. Um, I also love other nutraceuticals that help to support joint health, especially Dosequin Advanced. Our chondroprotectants give the basic building blocks of cartilage, kind of like our polysulfated glycosamine and glycan in our Adequan and also can have an anti-inflammatory effect. And some of these components as well um, are great. Like I love the Boswellia, which is an antioxidant. Curcuma, which comes from turmeric, that is an anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer. It's really well tolerated. You can crush it, you can mix it in food. They can just eat it like a treat. Also really like apocaps. Apocaps um, are, have natural anti-inflammatory and immune system supporting ingredients actually good for patients that don't even have cancer. Um, a lot of patients can benefit from these. And I tend to, I'm gonna use apocaps, probably do a little lower dosing than what is recommended on the bottle because it's just hard to get that many capsules into certain patients. That's the feedback from my clients. Um, you can give that capsule whole, you can open and mix it in warm water every eight to 12 hours, depending on the patient's needs. Same company makes apocaps also has a kind of more day-to-day -day supplement, which is called Everpup. Some of the same ingredients, but with glucosamine and probiotics. 
Uh, Cardiff was on this for a long time and he tended to tolerate it really well. I love this product. I take it myself, standard process Boswellia complex, both antioxidant and anti-inflammatory Boswellia, celery seed fruit, ginger rhizome, curcumin, that good turmeric. It's a tablet that's really easy to swallow. I take two of them per day. And it's also great for like large dogs that are having osteoarthritis, but you wouldn't probably need to give this on top of say like the Dosequin Advance because they both have um, turmeric in it. You may just wanna choose one or the other. But see there you have options. It gives you different choices of what you can actually choose your patients. It's probably the most common herbs that I use in practice are from TCVM Herbal, um, also known as Jingtong Herbal. I love Wei Qi Booster. In Chinese medicine, as I mentioned before, the Wei Qi is that kind of force field of energy that protects you from invading pathogens. Wei Qi Booster helps to tonify your, your Qi in your blood, promotes your Wei Qi, and also is touted to inhibit mutation. I don't really know how that is, 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 is um, determined, but um, the masters who taught me made me convinced me, and I used it with uh, my dog Cardiff food cancer and other patients and it's really helpful. You're seeing in this image little T pills, which are like little black BBs, really easy to get into patients, a little bit more easily than granules, which are just like a powder. There's a lot of aroma to them, sometimes a taste deterrent, but granules also could be encapsulated into clear gelatin capsules for easy administration and less of a flavor or aroma issue. So great for patients getting chemotherapy, immunosuppressive therapy, when they generally need immune system support like a developing puppy or kitten. Also love doxorubicin, like kind of like an herbal anti-inflammatory. Um, it helps to tonify your kidney yang. Your kidney yang is really important when it comes to osteoarthritis. A lot of patients that have osteoarthritis have kidney yang deficiency. It helps to dispel wind, get that nasty wind and allergies out of the body. Helps with cold and dampness, invigorates your chi and blood. Um, similar format, T-pills, granules, encapsulated. I just wanna be cautious with using this in addition to a non sterile anti-inflammatory. You may wanna kind of move towards one or the other because it's not really known how well they're gonna to play together. Hopefully not have harm, but you just don't actually know. Um, so caution, we wanna make sure we're not giving nutraceuticals and herbs when patients are getting chemotherapy and radiation, generally just on the day of their chemo radiation because what you're giving could help to have an antioxidant effect that could counteract some of the oxidating effect of chemo radiation. If there's digestive tract intolerance, like vomiting, diarrhea, reduced appetite, ease of administration, you have a little, a lot of options. So sometimes you have to really do your research and find what's going to be best for that particular patient, or just the, your, your experience. You're going to know what's going to be better tolerated by that patient. We don't really want to overlap too many ingredients. I, I especially when working at veterinary cancer group, I would get these clients coming with like literal laundry baskets full of products that they found online. This cures cancer. This helps to do this. I'm like, just one thing at a time, one particular product tends to work best and really kind of space them out. So you're not overwhelming the body with like eight different things, giving it eight in the morning with their morning meal, try to spread them out throughout the day. And also your purity of ingredients, like use reliable products. That's why I use the products that I mentioned. They are either human products that are used in animals or it's a human company that has branched off into, into veterinary medicine and some of them even do research. Um, you have to be concerned about the long-term use of herbs because they don't necessarily have the same research behind them as medications that show that they are safe for long-term. Sorry, I needed to sit talking so much. <laughs> okay, case studies, our last three things, and then we're done. All right, so Cardiff, my little special dog, was a Welsh Terrier. He was a neutered male. I like struggled with the decision to neuter him or not because I've seen a lot of patients just be healthy when they keep their reproductive parts. He was born in 2005. I put him to sleep in November 2016. I can't believe it's been four years. Um, Cardiff had Cardiff was a lemon, and his lemon problems emerged uh, about two years of life when he developed his first of four bouts of IMHA, with the most recent being in 2014, um, kind of in between when he was getting chemotherapy and not taking his immunosuppressive drug. Um, he also developed T-cell lymphoma, which could be related to having been on azathioprine for so long, which helps to modulate your immune system and affects your T-cells. So he ultimately developed T-cell lymphoma in 2013, which manifested as a tumor on a loop of small intestine. He needed an exploratory lap to remove it, to resect an anastomose and biopsy local lymph nodes. He also had chemotherapy. Um, he went through eight months of chemotherapy, a traditional CHOP protocol, which he completed in 2014. He tolerated his chemo generally extremely well. Of course, I used the complementary and alternative approach with him. His primary issues are IMHA and T-cell lymphoma. His secondary issues are osteoarthritis in his right and left front limb in his little toes there, his phalanges, he developed OA. And actually that was some of like the manifestation 
of his um, IMHAs, he would develop a polyarthropathy and be very painful, even also in his mouth and his TMJ joint. Um, I gave him omega fatty acids, injectable chondroprotectants when he wasn't hemolyzing, ever pup during the day, and um, vitamin, uh, 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 vitamin B12 and iron supplements. I would make a cocktail um, and um, administer it to him directly by mouth, which he tolerated extremely well. Pre and probiotics on his kitchen goat milk or Nutrigest. Sometimes he didn't like the taste of Nutrigest, so we went to the goat milk. I fed him a human grade whole food diet. Got Lucky Dog Cuisiner on his kitchen. This is before I was involved with Pure. Um, also lots of healthy table foods. Uh, he got acupuncture and acupressure quite a bit. No, not when he was hemolyzing, I didn't even acupuncture then, but to help him with his lethargy, his digestive issues associated with his cancer, his chemotherapy. He had a little bit of a chemotherapy side effects where he had an extravasation of um, vincristine and he had swelling uh, around his lateral saphenous vein, which I noted when he was sitting on a surfboard, we were doing a media project with my friend, Lauren Nativa. I'm like, wow, he's sitting kind of funny. This is the day after chemo. I'm like, oh, he can't fully bend his limb because the chemo got out of his limb. So I used laser to try to reduce some of the swelling there. And that really significantly helped him. My precautions, of course, were using NSAIDs at the time of IMHA because of the coagulopathy, using acupuncture during an IMHA occurrence. Definitely don't want to do that. Um, we want to make sure we're not doing our acupuncture directly through cancer. Of course, with lymphoma, it could be everywhere. That makes it a little more challenging. Um, and then using laser on the body because of the fact that cancer cells really could be anywhere. So I would do that localized laser treatment to help with just that particular area. Ooh, going back to that. So Cardiff was great um, until 2015 when he had a recurrence of his cancer, same clinical signs. It did the full workup. Ultimately, it ended up being the same cancer, different location. He had surgery, which um, removed it again. So that put him right into remission. We went through a modified course of chemotherapy. There's his tumor and the lymph node biopsy. Uh, he had T-cell monoclonal antibody, which, um, which was a newer treatment at the time. And he showed no side effects from it. Sometimes there are concerns that it could trigger um, an IMHA episode or something like that. And I was trying to decide, should, she ha should he have chemotherapy again? I ultimately did a modified course of chemotherapy with the CHOP and monoclonal antibody. Cardiff really, even though he had IMH and cancer, had an amazing quality of life. Like in between his bouts of usually fatal disease, he was running on the beach, he was feeling good. He, we went to a, an opening of a pet store in Beverly Hills called Pussy and Pooch and Jane Lynch came with me. And on the red carpet, he was photographed with her and in People Magazine online, he, li he lived a great life. Um, he ultimately succumbed to a respiratory problem where his laryngeal folds would not work properly. He was getting a CT scan. Biopsy only showed inflammation. I couldn't control the inflammation with steroids and inhalant steroids and everything I was doing. And so ultimately he was euthanized when his quality of life was so compromised. I didn't want to do a tracheotomy um, or he would have needed a laryng laryngectomy and a tracheostomy at that point. I'm like, you're almost 11. You've been through a lot. It's time to say goodbye. Two more cases. We'll move them quickly, I promise. Um, JP was a really cool little dog, big dog, actually, Rottweiler mix. Um, or full Rottweiler, he had sar a sarcoma on his right elbow, which also had metastasized to the spleen or vice versa. We weren't quite sure. It was thought it went from elbow to spleen. He was a patient of Dr. Mosen Dr. Mosen Dr. Mona Rosenberg. Secondary issues as well. He had some historical osteoarthritis. Definitely in his right knee, we suspected it in his right and left elbow and his T-alpha sets, but we didn't actually have imaging of those places. He got chemotherapy. Um, I started him on omega fatty acids. He was on DVM3 form SNP tips, which we changed to um, Nordic Naturals over time. He got an oral contraprotectant, dosequin with, with MSM. He got GI support in the form of Nutrigest. He got a multivitamin. The owners came to me and he was taking pet tabs, which I'm like, yuck. Corn sugar, corn syrup, sorbitol, and sugar. There's some kind of controversy about should diet and cancer patients as well. Like we don't want to put sugar in the body, but the patient can actually eat like sweet potatoes and carrots because they have other benefits. A lot of people read like you give your pet sugar or any kind of food that has sugar and it's going to promote the cancer. The body's always trying to like normalize blood sugar levels. It, uh, it just how fast the cancer extracts sugar from the blood, but the all body through insulin is always trying to normalize it. So I don't have a problem with patients getting some sugar if it comes from like fruit or vegetables. JP also got some Denimere to help to promote his, um, his liver health and also have some pain modulating effects. He, we started him on Chinese herbs. He got Wei Chi booster just once a day because we didn't want to kind of overwhelm him, overwhelm with supplements. They transitioned him off of a very hot, hot diet, a home prepared lamb diet and also kibble based lamb, both 
heating protein sources to a cooling home prepared version of turkey, brown rice, peas, carrots, and broccoli. He got as needed non steroidal anti inflammatories. He got opiates as needed. He got some um, tramadol to be able to reduce his frequency. I gave him acupuncture generally every week to every month, depending on what his needs were some needles and some B12. My cautions with him were to not needle right around his cancer, to, uh, to be cautious with laser on his places um, of pain, just because I didn't want to kind of put laser energy right around where the spleen was, especially in the thoracolumbar and the lumbosacral area. I wanted to minimize his digestive tract upset. Um, and ultimately, he had a reduced size of his right elbow sarcoma. Uh, which was probably through his chemotherapy. We improved his lameness. He had a better quality of life. He had better comfort along his TL spine. His uh, splenic sarcoma was stable for a lot longer. His digestion was better. He tolerated his chemotherapy as a result of the cooling home prepared diet. Um, last case, a really cool case, Tina the Husky. She was a really unique dog. She had a very high grade sarcoma in her left hip, which was diagnosed in late 2013. Her secondary issues were she had right hip and left stifle osteoarthritis. Um, ultimately, of course, the left stifle wasn't an issue because the, the leg was removed. <laughs> and so the, the left limb was removed. You can see that severe right hip osteoarthritis there. She had her primary cancer treatment was amputation. She didn't have chemotherapy or radiation. It deemed, wasn't deemed necessary. Um, so we kept on like monitoring her. She repeatedly was staged. She got omega fatty acids contraprotectants, oral, and also injectable. I taught the owners how to give the injection. She was on GI protectants in the form of Nutrigest. She did need a non anti-inflammatory sometimes when she had a flare-up, got gabapentin at the time of her amputation, opiates as well at the time of amputation. She uh, took well to her Chinese herbs. She took Wei Qi booster just once a day, Boswellia complex once a day as well to give that turmeric. Um, and then a cooling home prepared diet. They're feeding a biologically appropriate raw food diet. Up to the cancer diagnosis, I don't recommend raw meat diets for patients that have cancer. And also she was eating Yukonuba. So high heat cooked, warming, get that out of the body. They transitioned to a cooling diet of home prepared ingredients, cycling through different vegetables. And she really quite thrived on it. She also loved her CC loop. I actually had an extra one that I gave to the family and they would use it all the time. She would go to rehabilitation um, and she really, really just tolerated that, um, that the CC loop laid across her right hip and her right knee. Cautions, doing needle, laser, any kind of treatment right around the amputation site as well if there are still cancer cells there. Concern for cancer recurrence because her primary treatment was surgery. And she ultimately did incredibly well. She decided to move to Spain or her owners moved to Spain. And interestingly, she had been off of heartworm preventative for three to four months and she got heartworm disease in Southern California where we don't have as much of a heartworm indication, but that's why I actually recommend patients stay on heartworm all year round. Tina, I think has passed on, but this is, um, we don't have time at this point, I think, but this is um, a news report that talked about Tina, um, which maybe I'll figure out how to shorten my presentation and show next time. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of move on. We'll give people a break, let them go about their days. Thanks for joining me today. Sorry, I went a little bit over, just had a lot to say.